The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them the fire of thy love. Set forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost. Grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. May the divine assistance remain always with us. And may the souls of the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest, rest in peace. peace. Amen. And O Mary, seat of wisdom, pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins. He's a member of the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church right here in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. Thank you. Yourself? Doing well, Father. Thanks for yeah. being here. Father, I would like to get into the email inbox tonight and try and get through a few questions. And uh, this first one here is a great question concerning some of the uh, Brief Catechism for Adult videos that you made in the Catechism series. And uh, this viewer wrote in and said that uh, in some of the videos your teachings seem to indicate that if someone is not a Catholic, but still, through good works, acquires sanctifying grace in his soul, that soul can go to heaven seems this is contingent on the, quote, through no fault of his own. So how do you interpret this statement? Does this mean that Episcopalians and Baptists, etc., can go to heaven if they live to glorify Christ? Does the nature of sanctifying grace consequently exclude folks who are not Christians from ascending into heaven? What are your thoughts on that, Father? How would you answer that question? Well, I'm glad that this uh, writer proposed this question because... Uh, uh, what's there is not what I would say, and not what the Church would teach, actually. That uh, one who is not baptized cannot gain or earn sanctifying grace, or gain win sanctifying grace by good works. That's impossible. Uh, it has to be a free gift from God, giving sanctifying grace to the soul. And um, so nothing that we do ourselves of ourselves can possibly have a supernatural goodness to it that would warrant or deserve what is supernatural, sanctifying grace. Um, does one have to be baptized with water <clears throat> to be in the state of sanctifying grace? Okay, there are those who insist that that is so. The Catholic Church, however, uh, says explicitly that is not so. And not that uh, she in any way is contradicting the, the words of Christ, but she's contradicting the false understanding of those who deny such a thing as baptism of desire or baptism of blood. The Church teaches there is only one sacrament of baptism, with the, the matter for the sacrament of baptism is the pouring of water or the, the running, flowing of water over the body of the person being baptized, and the statement, the form of the intent, that is to baptize the person in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. That, and that alone, is the sacrament of baptism. But the Church does teach that God can give the grace of baptism. God can give sanctifying grace to the soul. Uh, otherwise, he has the power to do so. And, uh, for example, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which was first published in the year 1566 by St. Pius V himself, actually. It bears his name, uh, the first, very first edition of the Catechism of the Council of Trent. states explicitly, with regard to the baptism of adults, that the Church is not in a hurry, as it were, to baptize adults as she would be with children. <clears throat> because adults uh, can make an act of faith and an act of hope and an act of charity. What the Church says is this, that the Church knows that if an individual who intends to be baptized 
He's a catechumen learning the faith with the intention of being baptized as a Catholic. But he dies, and through no fault of his own, he has not yet been baptized with the sacrament of baptism. That, that person's intention to receive the sacrament, okay, there's the desire, and sorrow or contrition for sin, will avail that soul, that might, but will avail that soul, to justification and grace. Okay? And uh, this is what is necessary for eternal salvation, right? We also know that God can give the virtues of faith and hope and charity to the soul. He offers that, that grace of faith and hope and charity to souls. When I have a soul, when I have someone come to the door of the rectory and say, I want to be instructed in the Catholic faith because I've come to the conclusion that it is the true faith. Right? That person is already moved by a virtue of faith to say that, to acknowledge that. Right? Even though the person does not know the particulars of the faith necessarily and needs to be instructed, as the Catholic Church says in the Catechism of the Council of Trent with regard to the Church Church's approach to baptizing adults. That adult comes, is, is brought to learn the faith with the intention of being baptized in the faith because that, that adult already has made that act of faith that the Catholic faith is the true faith. Very, I, I have yet to have anyone come to me saying, I want to learn the Catholic faith because I suspect it might be the one true faith and I want to find out if it is. Usually those who come, come and say, well, I've learned enough to believe that it is the one true faith. <clears throat> and I want to learn the faith and I want to be baptized. <clears throat> so, you know, as we go through the course of instruction, it is clear that the, the soul makes it very clear, that individual makes it very clear that he places his hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, and that's why he's there. That's why he's coming for instruction. That's why he's looking to be baptized, okay? And is also motivated, clearly, by a, a certain love for our Lord. To go through the process, right? take the time and the effort and study and learn, and in some cases actually lose uh, some friendships who, with people who will turn against him, maybe even employment. Who knows what? You know, peace in his home, uh, acceptance in his own home sometimes. But he's chosen, rather, a love for our Lord. Now, does this mean that someone who's coming as a catechumen already has what is necessary to be saved? Not necessarily, obviously, um, because his faith may be very seminal and his uh, hope, you know, not firm yet. And his charity might be far from perfect yet, but he has enough uh, faith and hope and charity to be doing what he's doing and learning the faith with the intention of being baptized. Um... But the church does tell us that if the person were to die in that state, there is a certain confidence that the faith and the hope and the charity, that is to say the intention to be baptized, and the contrition for sin will avail the soul of, of uh, salvation. That is justification and uh, grace, which we call sanctification. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about the baptism of desire, it's not just any old, warm, fuzzy thought you know, about God, about our Lord, about the Church. It's not just that what the liberals want to, to mean, that even if one had at some time any vaguely uh, cheerful thought about our Lord or about the Church, that he's automatically saved by that. That's, that's, that's not true. That resembles more the Lutheran faith thing, that you make the, the go to the altar call, you know, accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, and you're saved from then on. And you cannot be unsaved. But that's not what the Catholic Church teaches. Uh, when she talks about a baptism, uh, when she talks about the desire, she's talking very clearly about an explicit desire and the intent to be baptized. And um, so it's not just some vague, wishful thought about doing something nice for God. It's much more than that. But also, um, we know that for, in order for anyone to, to, to save his soul, 
He must love God more than anything else. To be in the state of sanctified grace, one must have a love for God which supersedes the love for anything else. It doesn't mean that one has a perfect love for God, and one God that one loves God with all of his heart and all of his mind and all of his soul and all of his strength. That's the love that is necessary to enter heaven. But uh, the love necessary to be saved means that a person must love God more than any other, than anything, than any created thing. And our Lord pretty much told us that when the rich young man came to him and said, Master, what must I, must, must I do to have eternal, everlasting life? And our Lord said, if you would have everlasting life, keep the commandments. And then the young man says, well, I've kept those from my youth. Then our Lord said, well, if you want to be perfect, then do this. So our Lord himself made the distinction between what is necessary to be saved and what is necessary to be perfect, to be ready for heaven, so to speak. So um, uh, I don't know that that really answers the question that is addressed there adequately or not, but uh, I want to be very clear on the fact that one cannot earn earn sanctifying grace, right. but that God can give the grace that one that the sacrament of baptism gives, that God can give that grace as the church herself teaches, mm -hmm. through the desire, the actual intent to be baptized, and um, and have true contrition for one's sins. Right. And Father, these examples that you're giving, these seem to deal with a, an individual that has at least to some degree accepted or, or wants to accept the Catholic faith and religion. But if I may, I believe the, the, the problem of this question, the confusion often arises with those who, who don't even have that. Um, there's a, a quote here from the, uh, from the brief catechism for adults where it says, a, quote, non-Catholic who through no fault of his own does not realize that the Catholic Church is the only true church and who dies with sanctifying grace in his soul will go to heaven. And I believe that is where the real difficulty arises uh, because here you have a soul who has not knocked on your rectory door asking to, to be admitted into the Catholic faith. He, he does, has not uh, expressed a desire to, to learn the Catholic religion. So how can a soul like that be saved if he has... Well, look at the statement. It says if he's in the state of sanctifying grace. The question is, can a soul... Can a person who is not formally a member of the Catholic, Catholic Church be in the state of sanctifying grace or not? Yes. Um, the question is not whether someone who is in the state of sanctifying grace can be saved. Of course, that's the whole point, right? Yes. What is in the state of sanctifying grace, what is a child of God, an heir of heaven, we say in our own catechism. And um, so... You know, again, not to mis misinterpret the question, go off in the wrong direction here. Of course, someone who's in the state of sanctifying grace must be saved. That's the point, right? Um, and um, is one is sanctifying grace the same as the virtues of faith and hope and charity in the soul? And the answer is no. Sanctifying grace is not the same as the virtue of faith the virtue of hope, and the virtue of charity. But it is a fact that one must have those virtues in the soul, the virtues of faith, and of hope, and of charity, to be in the state of sanctifying grace. <clears throat> without those virtues, it is impossible to please God. St. Paul says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Right there. So, um, so how can a non-Catholic have faith? That's the question. How can a non-Catholic, one who's not formally a member of the Catholic Church, have faith and hope and charity? Right? How about the virtues? The virtues of faith. Because when I talk about the faith, have the faith, I mean they know the teachings of the Church and they believe them all. Right? But how can one who doesn't know them believe them? Well, one must have the virtue of faith, and the virtue of faith we read in our own moral theology manuals is, is, is the, the power, the supernatural power given to the intellect of the human mind, of the, of the human soul, to um, in, embrace the faith, to embrace the truth, to want the truth, to love the truth. 
and uh, to want to know the truth of God and to want to follow the truth of God, absolutely. To assent to all the truths that God has revealed, the ones that the individual knows, even the ones that the individual doesn't know and still must learn. But the assent is already given to whatever God has revealed because God has revealed it. And the, the soul in that situation might be well aware of the fact that I do not know all that God has revealed, but I actually do believe it already because God has revealed it. And all I have to do is learn what those truths are. He already has belief. That's the virtue of faith, you see. Can that happen? Yes, it does. It can. It certainly, God can give that grace to a soul. Could that God give the grace to a soul, then, uh, who might be wandering, who might actually see what's going on now in the Novus Ordo Church, think that's the Catholic Church, and I certainly don't believe that. They may hear Francis say the things he says, pro-socialism, right? Things that he says that are offensive to pious ears about our Lord, about our Blessed Lady, right? <clears throat> Uh, and say, well, I don't believe that. No, that's not right. But think that that's Catholicism and reject it. And really, in fact, what they're rejecting is not Catholicism. It's a, a fraud that is being perpetrated in the name of Catholicism. And, um, and the reason why the person rejects the fraud is because they actually believe what the Catholic Church teaches without even really realizing that it is what the Catholic Church teaches. <coughs> God can give a person who has the virtue of faith the grace of virtue, the virtue of hope too, to put their absolute hope or their hope absolutely in the merits of Jesus Christ with the utter confidence that if they are faithful to Christ that they will be saved, that the promises of Christ are true. And then one, uh, if one cooperates with those graces of faith and hope, God can offer that soul the grace to have a love for God, a real love for our Lord. And uh, that person can accept that grace and have the virtue of charity. So you can have the virtues of faith and hope and charity uh, within the soul even, even prior to baptism. The question is, is the faith and hope and charity that is in that soul, is that at the point, is that, that perfect enough to actually avail to the salvation of the soul. Well, the Church has said it, it very well can. And with the intention to be baptized and the cont true contrition for sin, and by the way, when the Church says that, the Church is already saying that that soul is moved by charity because that is the foundation for true contrition. Right? Contrition is a repentance for sin that is motivated by a love for God, and that's what charity is. So the Church is actually saying that the charity in that soul to repent of its sins with that intention to be baptized because the soul believes that this is the true faith will avail its soul of justification and grace, sanctification. So the point is that these virtues of faith, hope, and charity are going to be very present in the soul, active in the soul, even before the water of baptism is poured. And the Church has pronounced on this, on this subject in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, under the name of St. Pius V himself, that this is the belief of the Church. Now, there are those who want to argue by drawing texts from here and texts from there, and generally, these texts really are, are not about baptism of desire or baptism of blood. They're not about that. They are about salvation outside the Church. But that actually is talking about another issue that's not actually directly ad addressing the question of baptism of desire. <coughs> the Church is essentially saying that those who have the intent to be baptized and have true contrition for their sins, born of a love for God, already have faith, hope, and charity in the soul. And that, yes, if, they, if these truly are the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, they will be saved by that's what the Church is actually saying. And what the Church is actually saying by that is they are already incorporated into the Church. If not formally, they are somehow connected to Christ and they thus somehow be united with the Church. It's impossible that anybody can have the virtues of faith and hope and charity 
and not be united with Christ. They have to receive those graces from God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's the only way one can have faith and hope and charity as virtues in the soul. And it's the only way that a soul can be in the state of sanctifying grace. And so given the fact that somebody can be in the state of sanctifying grace, before the pouring of the water of baptism, that already means that that soul must somehow be incorporated with Christ or somehow united with Christ before that, and therefore with the church also. Father, I believe I've heard it expressed before in these terms that those who have yet to receive baptism but have this uh, faith, hope, and charity and sanctifying grace in their soul, that they actually belong to the soul of the church rather than the body of the church. One has to be very careful. One has to be careful about that. Okay. Because that can be understood in a very wrong way. Okay. Okay. Um, So uh, I just caution you, you know. There are those who state that and... They mean that in a very ecumenical way. Okay. As though there's a sort of vague soul of the church out there floating around somewhere that you belong to, which is somehow distinct from the actual body of the church, you know. Um, So one has to avoid that pitfall, okay? Mm. That that can be kind of a form of uh, ecumenism, pseudo ecumenism. But. It really does come down to the the matter that uh, the church teaches that one can be, uh, one's, uh, let's say, intention, again, I repeat this because people like to to argue the point about outside the church there's no salvation, whereas there is no argument about that. That's the truth of the the faith. It is absolutely a dogmatic truth of the Catholic faith Mm -hmm. that outside the church there is no salvation. That is not the question. The question is, can someone be in the, have the virtues of faith and hope and charity who is not yet a Catholic and has not been baptized? And the answer is yes. God can give those graces and a soul can receive them. Uh, the question is, can a soul uh, in the state of, who has the virtues of faith, hope, and charity be in the state of sanctifying grace? And the answer is yes. They accompany sanctifying grace. Okay. The question is, if the soul in the state of sanctifying grace were to pass to God for judgment, would the soul be saved? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The church has already ruled on these things. So the question is, well, how does having the virtues of faith, hope, and charity then already, you know, incorporate one, as it were, into the church? Is it possible for a soul to be in the state of sanctifying grace who is not yet baptized with the sacrament of baptism? The answer is yes. And the question is, how does that actually happen? How does that work? There has to be an explanation for that. And there are those who have actually made an explanation for that. But the fact is, though, that that would be impossible for any soul on earth unless those graces came through Jesus Christ and through the church already. So somehow, uh, every single soul in the state of grace in the face of the earth must be already, quote-unquote, somehow incorporated with Christ and united with our Lord. Okay. By grace, and it, it can't come from any other source. It has to come from our Lord. It has to come from our, from our Lord's church. Right. All right. Well, thank you, Father. I think we can. Okay. Finish. If there's a follow-up question, <laughs> uh, send it in. Well, well, might be some lingering uh, wonder about that. Uh-huh. I'd like to know what it is. Sounds good. Okay. Well, then, uh, next question, Father, concerns the first Friday and first Saturday devotions. This viewer asks. How, uh, in the current circumstances in the church, how can we receive the associated promises and graces when there is no traditional Latin Mass available on First Fridays and Saturdays? Well, what is required is a reception, the worthy reception of Holy Communion for First Fridays. And for First Saturdays, a 15 minutes meditation on the Passion of Our Lord and also five decades of the Rosary. Right? Um, Lucia with, was asked with regard to the five First Saturdays, if it would be permitted for those who cannot receive on Saturdays uh, to receive on Sunday. And her answer, as I understand it, was that uh, they would have to talk to the pastors of the church. If the pastor said that they could receive the communion on Sunday, then that would be acceptable. Okay. Okay. I don't know of any uh, exception with regard to the first Fridays. Um, But it's, it's possible, given the times that we're in right now, uh, that that would also apply, apply, that one could ask the traditional Catholic pastor 
the traditional Catholic priest, right, who's in charge of the chapel or the mission or the church they go to, uh, could give a, a decision on that, right, at least a prudential decision. But I understand Sister L uh, Lucia, uh, during her lifetime, was asked and responded that the pastor of the church, is, she's obviously referring to a true Catholic priest here, uh, could allow that for the first Saturdays, okay. the Sunday reception. Sounds good. Um, next <clears throat> question then. This uh, viewer wrote in and said he has a question regarding church architecture. Uh, in reading more about the medieval church, I discovered that most, if not all, parishes had a rood screen separating the sanctuary from the nave of the church, and also that no churches had pews until after the Catholic Reformation, pews themselves being a Protestant invention. With this, Roman Catholic churches would be closer than to what we see today in the Eastern Rite and Orthodox churches with the congregation standing for the liturgy and the rite at the altar behind. Uh, my question then is why were rood screens removed and pews installed in churches? Well, in the first place, uh, a rood screen is not an R-U-D-E screen. Uh, people hear the word rude and they think in terms of being impolite. Uh, some uh, might be a little confused by it, but rude is R-O-O-D, R-O-O-D, rude being an old English word for cross, right? So it is a, a screen that was basically, uh, essentially where the communion rail was in the traditional churches. And it was actually a screen at a canastas where they had the pictures of the saints and, uh, and uh, rather elaborate or a night piece of uh, furnishing. And it separated the uh, sanctuary from the nave of the church where the people were. So people who still remember the traditional churches with the communion rails uh, realize that there was a division there between the sanctuary where the priest and the service were for mass <clears throat> and the area where the people knelt for mass. The communion rails have been torn away, uh, largely now. I know when we arrived at the church here, we found the communion rail, beautiful marble communion rail, had been dismantled and buried, literally buried in the dirt under the church. We had to excavate it and and uh, have it reassembled to restore it. You know, but the barbarians a bit of a sort of have done this, <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> but. Many of the Catholic people who remember, even remember that are not familiar with the root scheme. <clears throat> and they don't realize that, that in the Eastern Rites, in particular to this day, where the communion rail is, there would be a, uh, a wall, essentially. And it, it might be um, a screen, it might be a, like an ornate kind of fence type of thing, but it would be a wall with large pictures hanging there that would separate the people from the from the sanctuary. And uh, that cross screen or root screen <clears throat> um, was meant to define the Holy of Holies. It was meant to be like a symbol of the fact that in the sanctuary you have the altar and you have the presence of God in the Holy Eucharist, the, the divine presence of God made man, and there you have the Holy of Holies. Um, <clears throat> it was meant to stress the sanctity of the area where the Holy Sacrifice took place, the altar area and so on. Now, the root screens are still there in any traditional Eastern Rite Church. Even the Orthodox will hold on to the, will, will continue the, the old tradition of the root screens. In the West, the root screens uh, gradually withered away, more or less. And uh, so, the communion rail remained to define the distinction between the sanctuary and the nave, where the people, people sat, and uh, or stood and attended the mass. Um, so it's not as though the rood screen disappeared entirely, but it's still represented by the tra the traditional communion rail with its gates. Okay, so it became kind of minimalist in a way. 
And uh, why did the ruined screen disappear in the West? I don't know. It just did. You know, it, it, it well, when I, when I, why did the ruined screen, as it were, be reduced? Why was it reduced to the communion rail? Uh, that I, I don't know. But it was, in fact. And um, I can't help but think that it had much to do with the desire to enable the people to watch the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. I mean, the priest does turn during the Mass and address the, the, uh, those present, Dominus Oviscum, the Lord be with thee, and with thy spirit, to serve his answer. And our Lord does turn, and he does, I mean, I'm sorry, the, the priest does turn to address the people in the Arate Fratres. Right? He has, all should pray this, not just the servers, but all should pray uh, that my that the sacrifice should be acceptable to God in heaven. You know? And um, so that minimizing the root screen to just the pinion rail to allow the people to see that and hear might be a, a form of legitimate encouraging active participation of the people. There is such a thing as legitimate active participation. That doesn't mean that they all shout out the answers. It's that they're all aware of what is going on and they can follow the Mass in their missiles and actually take part of it spiritually. And um, so, I mean, if there's a better answer, I'd like to know what it is, but I, I assume that it has much to do with that. Okay. What about this question um, of, yeah, of about the, of pews, the pews? This is the first I've ever heard that pews suddenly were, were invented by Protestants and were introduced into Catholic churches after the Reformation. Mm. I can tell you this much: it doesn't sound right to me at all. I, this goes contrary to everything I've heard, and I have no idea where this. I think this is misinformation. Not that the individual is misleading us, but I, I obviously he's read this or heard this somewhere. To begin with, I think that the idea that these pews were a Protestant invention and introduced into Catholic churches after the Reformation, there was such a resistance to the Reformation uh, that I think if, if Protestants introduced pews into their churches after they seized them and stole them and ransacked them and, and, and stripped them of everything Catholic, and they introduced pews, I don't think the Catholics would have said, oh, that's a good idea, why don't we, can we have some pews too? I think that would have been exactly the reason why we will never allow a pew in any of our churches ever, right? And uh, so this, to me, uh, rings very, very false. And um, the fact is, Tom, in Catholic churches, monasteries, <clears throat> The the uh, the sisters, the religious, the nuns there, the monks would go into the sanctuary. They would have choir stalls, and they would have kneelers in there. Right? They have choir stalls and kneelers in there. They would go in. They'd spend hours every day singing the divine office to Almighty God. Right? Praying, singing beautifully the hymns, the the psalms of the church, and so on. They might spend seven, eight, nine, ten hours in the in the Abbey of Tungerlo in Belgium. Uh, they pray. They sang entirely the office of the religious order, the Paramount Traditions, <clears throat> from Matins all the way through Compline. They sang the office of the Blessed Mother, and they sang the office of the dead every day. They were in the church singing to God ten ten hours a day at least. You know. I mean, that, I assume it would take that long. <clears throat> and they had the choir stalls where they would sit, and they had the kneelers in front of them where they would kneel at various times. They rose, they sat, they, they rose to stand, they would kneel, they would rise, they would sit. There's a certain choreography even that goes along with this, you know, as the body was involved in the act of adoration. And to see that as extended then into the pews for the people to rise, to kneel, to sit, it makes perfect sense to me that in, in Western monasticism, um, which formed, let's face it, it was the monks who were sent out as the missionaries into Europe, with the you know barbarian tribes arriving and in need of being conquered, not by swords, but by the cross, not by blood, but by faith you know, in our Lord. The monks were the ones who went among them. And this is what they brought, you know, and, and they 
building the churches in their prayer. This is what they said. And so the fact that this carried throughout Christendom in the West, uh, whereas in the East, the, the custom was to stand, stand for the entire ceremony. You know, that they were not given the luxury of sit, sit, sitting, sitting in the early days. The ancient basilicas did not have pews. It's true. And uh, would the people kneel down on the, on the marble floors of the basilicas? I don't think so, right? But uh, I honestly believe that the, the pews uh, that were introduced to the Catholic Church were introduced very early on, a thousand years and more before, before uh, in the West that is, a thousand years and more before the Protestant Reformation. And that they were actually kind of an extension of the prayer practices of the, the religious in the sanctuary. Um, so the the sacristation the the sacristation sacristation I'm sorry I'm having trouble with pronouncing uh, the the women and the men the male and the females that was very early on too in the early days you'd have the women on one side and men on the other. And, uh, but they were not just in kind of an amorphous mass of mob. I mean, they were, they were organized. And again, the pews uh, would help to make that possible. Okay. Now, Protestants might have placed a great emphasis on the pews because for them, uh, you know, I mean, the service was all about uh, preaching and uh, people were sitting. People were sitting for the sermonizing of the, uh, of the Protestant ministers, right? That was essentially their worship there. That's what it became. Um, but what you find in Protestant churches is seats but no kneelers. But in Catholic churches you found seats with kneelers for adoration, right? When the Novus Ero came in, one of the first things they did was rip the kneelers out and Protestantize everything, right? No surprise there. So again, I mean, you, you have to go back to the example of the, the religious, the cloistered sisters, the monks, their entrance into the church, their places in the choir, stalls as they're called, their seats where they would sit while singing the psalms, their kneelers where they would kneel down uh, for the mass, so on. It was all there. It just was extended down the nave for the people also. Okay, interesting. Uh, well, Father, I think we can do one more question here. I'd like to get your opinion on this. Uh, it's in regards to a recent program we did uh, regarding the Antichrist and the Restrainer. And uh, this viewer wrote in and said that uh, while watching that video, it came to me that the restrainer is Pope Benedict. And now that he has been removed, the false prophet, who is Bergoglio, will invite the Antichrist to enter into our church and the world. What do you think of that opinion, Father? Well, it's a nice thought, but I don't think it's right. I don't think it's true. Uh, Benedict was not a great champion of the faith. Quite the contrary. Benedict set the stage for... Francis already, and uh, I mean, in Benedict's manner and style, yes, he he was not he was not let's show, Jorge Bergoglio, he was not Francis, okay, and um, he might have been more reserved and seemingly more theologically inclined, and but the fact is, at Vatican II, he was one of the leading voices for revolution, that is, Ratzinger, okay. And throughout the whole process of the Novus Ordo, he definitely was a main contributor during John Paul II, and then his own tenure, right? So there are many atrocities that took place in the church. The church suffered grave losses, uh, and a great loss of faith, you yeah. uh, know, during, during Benedict XVI's tenure. So... I mean, people have to face that there's the, the legend, the myth of, of Benedict XVI. The modernists want to paint him as being a great champion of the traditional faith. But in fact, um, he, he is, uh, his years are very, again, destructive. Many of the people, well, many of those who voted for Bergoglio were put in position, put there by, by Benedict XVI. 
Benedict XVI actually put these people, many of them, in position and promoted them through the ranks up into the high upper echelons of power in the Novoserva Church. And he is responsible for the choice of Francis right now. And so, you know, it mystifies me when people say, well, you know, Francis um, is not the true Pope because Benedict didn't really resign, so we really need to get Benedict back because he's our man and, you know, he's really the staunch Catholic and so on. That's not, that is uh, not reality. And, um, and I, you know, I keep coming back to the reality that, wait a minute, there's a reason why Francis Bergoglio was uh, chosen by the very people right, who had elected these Novus Ordo uh, pontiffs all along. And um, if one uh, reads the literature of those who know what they're talking about, okay, even the liturgy of these cardinals, bishops, and archbishops who were involved in the process, it's very clear that Benedict XVI certainly uh, played a major role in bringing about what we have right now. Mm -hmm. And Father, I think this confusion just goes to prove this point that you often made where uh, these so-called conservative Novus Ordo Catholics, they're, they're actually more dangerous than the out-and-out -out liberals because they, they have this kind of veneer of Catholicism that they create, but it's not really Catholicism, and it's very misleading. And, and I believe you've, you've said before that perhaps with as, as bold and brazen as Francis has been, this actually might uh, accomplish some good because it, he makes it so obvious that, that he's so anti-Catholic and so modernist, whereas we have someone like Benedict um, manifestly is, is misleading so many souls because he at least has some kind of veneer of traditional Catholicism. Sure. Well, which is more dangerous, the wolf undisguised or the wolf in sheep's clothing? Exactly. All right. And uh, it's definitely the, the wolf in disguise. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why, we, as we read, that the devil himself can, ex can disguise himself as an angel of light. And he finds it uh, very effective in terms of tactics. So when you have a modernist who, as St. Pius X writes in his encyclical Pashendi, has the appearance of great virtue, the appearance of having great passion and love for the faith, for the church, there you find a modernist who is a very dangerous enemy of Christ mm -hmm. and the church. So um, you know, there's, no, there's no doubt about it that, uh, that uh, Benedict XVI is a modernist. And uh, I, I like it. I liken it this to, to this difference. And there are many, I suppose, who would scratch your heads and wonder what is what is Fudging is talking about now. But you know, I mean, the commun the communists, the Marxists, you had the Bolsheviks and you had the Mensheviks, and they they had ultimately the same idea of where they wanted to go, but they chose two different ways to achieve that path. The Bolsheviks won <laughs> because they were the more brutal of the two and they eliminated the Mensheviks very brutally uh, because the Mensheviks were willing to take their time, right? Like they're modernists who are willing to, let, to take their time. And I think Benedict's one of those. And that, I think, angered, angered the Bolshevik modernists, saying, we've got to get him out of the way because he's just not moving fast enough for us. We've got to get somebody in there who will just... Uh, come out with all modernist guns blazing and make it happen and just, you know, force Vatican II on everybody and crush anything that stands in the way. And they found Francis. That's what they got. And that's what they got. Wow. All right, well, Father, to end on a, uh, on a happy note, today is the feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Yeah. What, what do we have to learn from her? What is, uh, what is the great importance of this feast day? Well, first of all, of course, the brown scapiter. Everyone who is devoted to Our Lady, and that should be every Catholic, right? Certainly. It should every, every non-Catholic too, but they don't, <laughs> you know, they don't see it that way. But these Catholics who know Our Lady for who she really is and honor her and venerate her as the Mother of God, beloved of our Lord, and uh, that they want her arms around them. As our Lord, when our Lord came into the world, I mean, where did he begin his life in her womb? Where did he go? He went in her arms. He spent his early days in her, her arms. Day after day, week after week, most of our Lord's life was spent in the arms of our Blessed Lady. There is no better place to be. When our Lord was taken down to the cross, 
he was lowered down for the cross, but received her arms. Her arms received him, right? Bore him then to the, to the uh, grave and embraced him there. And this is where our Lord loved to be, right? Near our Lord, our Blessed Mother's Immaculate Heart. So what is this scapular? The bronze scapular is basically that. It is, it is essentially, by our, by our choice and our wish, our will, as our Blessed Mother's own spiritual children, to have her arms around us. And when we wear the scapular, essentially that is what we are doing. We're actually putting ourselves within the arms of our Blessed Lady. And as our Lord wanted his own heart to be near the Immaculate Heart of Mary, as he was enfolded in her arms. So that's where we want to be too. We want our hearts to be united with that Immaculate Heart of our Blessed Lady, who loved him with all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength. What better place to be near the heart like that, right? So, so um, <clears throat> we need to uh, think of Our Lady of Mont Carmel um, in terms of the scapular and wearing the scapular and not doing anything that would shame the scapular. It would be a shameful thing to wear the scapular and then to wear a modest dress. Those who wear a modest dress will give up wearing the scapular because it reveals the scapular and they see the contradiction and eventually they'll give it up. <clears throat> in favor of wearing the immodest dress, or they'll give up the immodest dress in favor of wearing the scapular. But they will see the contradiction if they try to do both. But uh, also, even historically speaking, you know, there was a, a vision. After the prophet uh, defeated the 450 prophets of Baal, um, he saw he saw a cloud form in the sky. And the cloud was in the form of a human foot. And the rains came after three and a half years of drought. This is after the defeat of the prophets of Baal, right? When all of the prophets of the true God were hiding except for one, right? And uh, that foot is a symbol of a prophecy in Genesis chapter 3.15 that she shall crush your head and you will lie in wait for her heel. Right? It's the symbol of the coming Redeemer and the triumph right, of Our Lady's Immaculate Heart. So uh, we need to uh, see, actually that's where the Carmelites get their name because it was on Mount Carmel that this, this event took place. So um, we need to see throughout the plan of God this mysterious woman, whom we know to be the noble woman, Mary, the mother of our Savior. And we need to honor her. There are those who say that in, dis that in honoring Mary, we are somehow dishonoring Christ. Nothing could be farther from the truth. That's absurd. In fact, no matter what honor we pay to Mary, if it's true, if it's a truth, it it cannot even begin to match the honor uh, that God has paid her by choos choosing her to be of all women, his own mother, in time and now in, you know, in, in heaven. Uh, how can one exceed that honor? One can dishonor Mary by treating her as though she's a divine being. One can dishonor her. She would feel greatly dishonored to be put in the place of God, that is certainly not what she ever intended to be on earth, and certainly doesn't want us to be doing now that she is in heaven. Um, but that's not based on the truth. But it's impossible to say anything that is true about Our Lady that would in any way dishonor her, <clears throat> or that would detract from the honor due to God. It, rather, it just does what Mary herself does. Those who honor Our Lady are actually doing what she herself did. What she herself did when she said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. When we honor lady, Our Lady, we are doing that. We're uniting our hearts with hers in doing exactly that. Right? Exalting God and rejoicing in Him. That's right. Thank you, Father. That's a very beautiful thought to end on. Very beautiful program. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate, welcome, appreciate well, your thank time. Thank you. Yeah. God bless you all. God bless our listeners, too.
Thanks to our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady at Fatima, to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and also to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.